turning to our text in Revelation 1, verses 4 and 5. Let's give our attention now to the reading of God's infallible and inerrant word. Exodus 3, beginning at verse 1. Now Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. He said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. So I've come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I've seen the oppression with, with, with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, come now. I will, send to you, I, I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring up the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you brought up the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. And Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they will say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Revelation 1 and the first part of verse 5 is our text. We'll read verses 1 through 5, or through the first part of verse 5, rather. Revelation 1, beginning at verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant, John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Amen. Be seated as we turn to our psalm of preparation 25a in the book of Psalms for singing. Thank you. 
Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we do look to you and your word now and ask that you would be pleased to answer the prayer that we have just sung to you, that you would show us your word, show us your truth, reveal it to us in this marvelous book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. We ask, Father, for the Holy Spirit's help. We bless you for the gift of the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. And we pray now that the power of the Holy Spirit would be made known in the congregation, both in preaching and in hearing. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In our uh, exposition last Lord's Day, as we looked at the first three verses of uh, Revelation, we considered a number of ways that the book of Revelation is communicated. Uh, for example, you may recall that we said that this, uh, this uh, Revelation is an apocalypse. It's apocalyptic uh, literature in the vein of, for example, Daniel and uh, Ezekiel. Also that it, it's a prophecy. It's called a prophecy. So this is an apocalyptic prophecy. We also talked about the ways uh, that, uh, especially in these first three verses, that revelation is communicated to us. That's the way uh, the New American translates this in verse 1. Uh, he sent and communicated it. Uh, and and we, we noticed we could, when we, we considered the way it's uh, communicated that it's in the form of an apostolic epistle. So like the other epistles or letters of the New Testament, there is a, there's an apostolic greeting, which is really a divine gre a greeting. It also features an apostolic benediction like most of the New Testament epistles, Revelation 22 21, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And that implies that though, as we are going to see, uh, we've already considered this, that uh, the, the, the letter is written to the seven churches of Asia, that it, is, uh, it applies to all of the churches of John's time, not just those seven churches in Asia, and because it has this apostolic greeting and uh, apostolic benediction, it applies to all churches of all time. And that means this book is relevant to us. It has profound uh, implication, not just for these seven churches in Western Asia Minor, uh, someone pointed out to me uh, after the sermon last Lord's Day that I said Eastern. It's not. Asia Minor is the whole of modern-day Turkey, uh, essentially. And these seven churches were in a semicircle, arranged in a semicircle in uh, Western. I have directional dyslexia, and I'm, I'm, I'm not really even kidding about that. I have, I, I have to think sometimes, is that East or is that West? Or, but nevertheless, um, uh, if you look at the map of modern-day Turkey, this was Asia Minor, and uh, that's the, uh, the region. And Asia is a Roman province in that Roman region of, um, of modern-day uh, Turkey. Another significant characteristic of Revelation is its heavenliness, its heavenly character. Revelation takes us up to heaven. As we, as we look at some of the visions in this book, we are going to get a window uh, into heaven. And it's a wonderful thing because we don't think about heaven enough. And we need to think about heaven uh, because it's one of the things that uh, our, our heavenly home, our uh, heavenly uh, destination uh, is... is uh, uh, 
that, that's where we're headed. That's, our, that's, that's what our pilgrimage, our, our sojourn in this world is all about. And in the text today, we are considering a divine greeting from heaven's throne. It's the Lord's greeting. When someone greets you warmly, uh, whether it's a family member, a church member, a friend, it can have a profound impact on you. Everybody wants to be greeted warmly. They want people uh, to, to look them in the eye and, and, uh, and to speak to them and to be uh, warm toward them, to be attentive. Uh, but there's no greeting like a heavenly greeting. Nothing in this world can compare to the heavenly greeting that we received from the Lord. And in our text, we are greeted by, uh, distinctly by each person of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's a foretaste of heaven on earth. <clears throat> Do you know this God? That's one of the things you ought to be asking yourself. Do you know him? Do you know something? Not just uh, a, a, an intellectual knowledge, but an experiential knowledge of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How do we know him? Well, we've already mentioned it today, and we've prayed it today. At least I have, and so you have too, because you prayed with me that God would be pleased to reveal himself in his word. That's how we come to know uh, the triune God. That's how we have fellowship with the triune God, the Son and the Holy, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Do you know him, at least in some sense? Have you come to know him? And do you treasure these greetings that he extends to us? It's a, it's a divine hand extending out of heaven itself, speaking to us, greeting us warmly. And it's a wondrous thing. In verses 4 and 5, we have in the first place, a greeting through apostolic agency. Secondly, a greeting to the seven churches. And thirdly, a greeting from the triune God. A greeting through apostolic agency. A greeting to the seven churches of Asia. A greeting from the triune God. So in the first place, it's a greeting through apostolic agency. Agency. Now, we've said something about the authorship of this book, and we won't, uh, we won't do, say much uh, of, of any length uh, this morning. But we did note in our introduction to uh, Revelation, we did consider the compelling evidence that the person who wrote Revelation referred to in this book as John in verse 1, again, uh, in uh, verse 4 of, of our text, that this is the Apostle John, one of the three apostles who were in the inner circle of the Lord Jesus Christ, along with Peter and James, perhaps the closest to the Lord Jesus Christ, because he calls himself the one whom Jesus loved in his in the gospel that he authored. And John authored uh, the, the three epistles uh, in the New Testament that, are, that have his name assigned to them as well. And John is revealed in uh, this book as a faithful servant. Verse 1 says that he is a faithful servant, a bond servant, uh, or a servant of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. He refers to him as, uh, uh, himself as a fellow partaker 
in the tribulation and perseverance of Jesus. Verse 9. We also noted that for some reason, uh, instead of killing John, as uh, so many of John's contemporaries were killed, so many of the apostles were martyred, that uh, John was exiled to the island of Patmos. It's off the coast of Asia uh, in the Aegean Sea. Uh, and so there's John in something of a Christian concentration camp. He's on the island of Patmos. Uh, and in these late days of the church, John is very likely the elder statesman of the church. So the greeting comes from heaven's throne, we have said. It does not come from John. It comes through John and his apostolic agency as an inspired writer of Scripture. And it's a good reminder that the Lord's greeting, if you look at your bulletin, uh, we, we have a... A, a greeting. We have a confession of dependence and Lord's greeting um, after the call to worship in our worship service. And we do this uh, because the church has been doing this uh, since ancient times, utilizing these apostolic greetings as these letters were, you remember, circulated among the churches, even as this one with its uh, with its apostolic greeting will be circulated among the seven churches and very well likely others, uh, that these apostolic greetings were read. They came through the agency of the apostles. They came from the throne of heaven itself. We ought to recognize that and we ought to appreciate them as we have them before us in Scripture and as we encounter them in worship. So it's a greeting through apostolic agency. It's a, secondly, it's a greeting to the seven churches of Asia. We've already noted that Asia is in the western part of uh, Asia Minor, uh, the, the province, a uh, Roman province, it's modern day Turkey. Um, it first appears in the New Testament in Acts 16, verse 6, where Luke describes Paul's desire on his second missionary journey to preach in that Roman province. But you remember uh, that there was, uh, that the Lord appeared to Paul there. Uh, we call it the Macedonian vision because a man from Macedonia appeared to Paul in a vision and God forbade Paul to preach in that region. And so instead, Paul went to uh, Macedonia, uh, modern day Greek, and he preached in the major cities of, of, of Macedonia there. Not till his third missionary journey that Paul ministered in Asia, and primarily at the church in Ephesus. It's very likely that the other churches, the other uh, six of the seven churches, uh, of Asia are, uh, were churches that, were, that come out of, that were planted by uh, the church at Ephesus. That's the way the gospel spread to these other cities in the, uh, in the province. And the question is raised, why to these seven churches only? Why, does, uh, why is this letter to be written, to uh, addressed to these seven churches and not others, because we know that there were other churches. Uh, for example, uh, the Church of Colossae. It's a pretty well-known church. We have, a, uh, we have an epistle to the Colossians, don't we? So it's a pretty well-known church. Why not that church? Why, why wasn't it uh, included as well? Last week we looked at... Um, a number of views of, of Revelation, and one of those views is the futurist approach. 
which sees uh, the visions and the events of Revelation, the, the, the events represented in those visions as happening uh, in the quite distant future. And some strains of that futurist approach to, revela to Revelation have interpreted, interpreted these uh, references to the church not as addressed to the first century church in Asia. They say it's not really to those churches. Those churches are just symbolic. They're symbols, which we said was an interesting departure from the literal when possible rule of the futurist approach to interpreting Revelation. When we looked at these views, we said uh, that while, uh, that, that although when we read historical books, uh, for example, First uh, and Second Samuel, uh, Judges, uh, in the Old Testament, Acts in the uh, New Testament, we normally take the plain literal meaning unless there's some compelling reason to interpret a passage otherwise. But in studying the apocalyptic books, like Revelation, that contain many symbols, we should flip the table. We should take things symbolically unless there's evidence that they are to be taken literal. What's interesting about this reference to the seven churches is that there's both a literal and a symbolic component. Uh, as John speaks about uh, the seven churches of Asia, the seven churches that are in Asia, they were literal churches that existed in the first century. And these letters, uh, the, the letter of Revelation was sent to these churches to be circulated among the churches that John uh, lists here, those seven churches of Asia. But it's here that we also encounter our first symbol, the number seven. And seven is a symbol of completion. And so uh, this is a symbol of not just those seven churches, but the whole of the church. Uh, seven is a number of, of perfection. And so, while John addressed these seven churches, as we've already mentioned, but I don't mind uh, repeating it again, wasn't meant for only these seven churches in the semicircle in the western part of Asia. It was for the church of John's day, all the churches of John's day, and it's for all the churches of all ages, which means John to the seven churches of Asia is equivalent to John to the churches of every people and age, and therefore to us. It's a greeting through apostolic agency. It's a greeting to the seven churches of Asia. It's a greeting from the triune God. Grace and peace. That's the common apostolic greeting. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's one of the most common apostolic greetings. And the words grace and peace in that order summarizes the means and the end of God's saving work. Grace, as you I'm sure have heard many times, is God's undeserved love or favor, or putting it even more strongly, it's undeserved favor despite demerit. Peace flows out of grace. Peace is... Uh, the reflection of, of God's smiling countenance upon his beloved children. God doesn't smile on us in our natural condition. That is the way we were born in our sinful nature. Rather, he must frown upon us because our natural condition by birth uh, is, uh, is a condition of condemnation and and subject to God's wrath. We were sons of disobedience, 
And our father was the devil in our natural condition of sin. But through the blood of Jesus Christ, by God's grace, through faith, all of that changes. God now deals with us not as we deserve, but according to the merit of His Son, Jesus Christ. Not according to our merit, but according to the merit of the Lord Jesus Christ. And He extends His grace to us as hell-deserving sinful people. When God smiles upon us, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This greeting is brought from each person of the Holy Trinity. We read first the greeting of the Eternal Father in verse 4. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come. That's a description of God the Father. The everlasting and unchanging Jehovah. We read this morning when Moses questioned God as to why he should be God's spokesman, why he should go to the people people of Israel, why he was the one uh, that would be God's spokesman and tell Pharaoh to to let go uh, of his people. He said to the Lord, what what should I tell the people when, uh, when I come to them? And they ask, "What what is God's name? Tell them, I am sent you. I am that I am. That two-word expression translates the Hebrew word that means to be, to exist. And so here, out of this, out of the, the burning bush, which is a symbol of, of God's eternal and unchanging name, uh, nature, God says, my name means uh, eternal. It means uh, everlasting. I'm the one who does not change. Therefore, uh, you sons of Jacob, you are not consumed. God is the one uh, of whom Moses spoke in uh, in. Psalm 90, which I believe was our a meditation, uh, the oldest psalm in the Bible. Moses, uh, the author of that psalm, the one who met with this everlasting God, says he is from everlasting to everlasting. God is, God was, he is, he is to come. He's the everlasting God. Nothing is more basic than to know that. To know that God is. I am. He is. He exists. Nothing is more basic to our role as creatures than this, to believe that God is. We're told that if anyone wishes to please God, Hebrews eleven six, he must believe that God is. That's basic to our faith and that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. You can't please God. Nothing you can do can please God unless you believe that he is. And then Jesus, you remember, spoke of these words, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, John 14, 1. Dear Christians, since God is, since God was, and since God is to come, there can be no greater grace, no more lasting peace than that which comes from the eternal Father. 
Second, we read in our text the greeting of the sevenfold spirit. Grace to you and peace from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Now this, uh, I remember uh, a member of the church not long ago. Her husband was a Marine and he was deployed at the time and when she... I began very early in my ministry using this uh, apostolic greeting uh, in the Lord's greeting, and uh, so she heard those words, the seven spirits who are before his throne, and she said, why do you say that? Why, why, why do you talk about the seven spirits who, who are uh, before his throne? And so I explained it to her in the way... Uh, much in the way that I'm going to explain it to you. Now, some question whether uh, this really is a reference to the Holy Spirit, by the way. Some interpreters do a question since uh, there are seven spirits before the throne and not one. But they must refer to the Spirit because nowhere does Scripture say that grace and peace comes to us from any other being than God. Only God is the dispenser of grace and peace. So it must be the Holy Spirit. And as we've already seen, there's a symbolic number here. And here's the repetition of that number, the seven spirits. Uh, they refer to uh, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. That's what's being symbolized here by the number seven. And furthermore, when we compare Scripture with Scripture in Isaiah 11:2. Uh, we find a prophecy that Christ, as the branch of Jesse, will be anointed with a sevenfold fullness of the Spirit. Now, we won't turn there, but if you were to turn, if we were to turn to that prophecy in Isaiah 11, 2, you would see a sevenfold description of uh, the anointing of Christ uh, and that. Seven, the, the way it's characterized there, sevenfold, it's significant. Then Zechariah in his prophecy, uh, chapter 4, verses 2 to 6, uh, in, in that prophecy, God asks the prophet what the seven lamps of the candlestick signify. And notice uh, we've got that imagery here in Revelation in uh, chapter 1. And God explains to the prophet, not by mount, might nor by power, but by my spirit, says of the Lord of hosts. And so the, the lamps of the seven candlesticks in that vision to Zechariah have to do with uh, the Holy Spirit and uh, the fullness of light. In other words, the, the church of Christ shines in the darkness of this world with a sevenfold fullness uh, of light by a sevenfold supply of the Holy Spirit. In Revelation 3. Verse 1, Christ describes himself as he that has the seven spirits of God. A reminder that God gave the spirit in fullness to Jesus. That he poured out, he anointed Jesus uh, with the Holy Spirit. That signified, you remember, at his baptism. Uh, that the spirit descended from heaven as a dove, and then it's especially apparent in Mark's gospel that it's the Holy Spirit who impels Jesus out into the wilderness to be tempted. So Jesus had the anointing of the Spirit. And even in his humanity then, he was enabled to perfectly obey the Lord and to overcome the temptation of uh, 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 of the wilderness. And then, of course, um, at Pentecost, we have this wonderful picture of the outpouring of, of the Holy Spirit uh, in, in Joel's prophecy at the uh, exaltation and enthronement of the Lord Jesus Christ, Acts 2.33. John the Baptist, you remember, said that God gave the Spirit to Jesus without measure. He's the, he's, he had the fullness uh, 
uh, of the Holy Spirit in a way that, that no other person has ever had in the history of salvation. The theologians call this, this expression, the seven spirits who are before his throne, the economic subordination of the spirit. Economic um, in contrast with the ontological or the being, the essence of the being of the Godhead. And this is important because we know that the Holy Spirit is God. We've already said this grace and peace comes from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He must be God if he is a dispenser of grace and peace. But it's the, the, uh, the way it's phrased here is the Spirit is before his throne, not on the throne, but before his throne. In his being, in his ontology, in the ontological sense of being, the Holy Spirit is God. But in the economic outworking of the Trinity, in the economy of the Trinity, he's before the throne. He's going out from that throne. And what does he do? The Holy Spirit has a brilliant spotlight. And he shines that spotlight on the person and work of Jesus Christ. The seven spirits, the fullness of the Holy Spirit that goes out from the throne of God takes the things of Christ, and he reveals them to us. And if you belong to Jesus, then you have had that spotlight shown upon you. He's taken the things of Christ. He's applied them to you. He's worked. Uh, he's given you new heart apart from which you can't, you can't believe, you can't repent of sin. It's impossible because your heart is stone, the Bible teaches, in your natural state. You have to have a new heart. You have to heart of, have a heart of flesh. It needs to be radic radical spiritual surgery, the, uh, the heart of stone, uh, open heart surgery, the heart of stone removed, a heart of flesh, spiritual flesh, beating spiritual blood, has to be replaced, has to uh, replace that heart of stone. And only then are you enabled to repent of sin and believe in Christ. Without that work of the Holy Spirit, it's impossible. You never will. You never see uh, Scripture as the divine revelation of God, apart from this work of the fullness of the Spirit, the sevenfold Spirit going out from the throne of God because the Holy Spirit is the illuminator and the Holy Spirit is the one that illumines our hearts. We've got all sorts of arguments about why this, that, and the other, why this cannot be uh, God's Word, but it's the Holy Spirit who does the work in us to convince us that it, it is indeed the absolute, inerrant, infallible Word of God. That's what the sevenfold spirit does. Finally, we have a greeting from the Son, the mediatorial Son, the mediator of God, the mediator between God and man, grace and peace from Jesus Christ the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Here's a threefold characterization of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is first the faithful witness. And that term here, witness, in the New Testament is the same word from which we get our English word martyr. 
And so Christians who are experiencing uh, in, uh, persecution at that time, the time in which John is exiled on the island of, of Patmos, those who are experiencing uh, death, the threat of death, and martyrdom are treading the way that Jesus has already taken. They could identify with the way Jesus is presented here as the faithful martyr, the one who has gone to the cross, and the one who's, in whose footsteps we are to walk in our suffering uh, in this world. We trace those footsteps. The great temptation for people uh, who experience uh, Christians who, are, who experience hostility and opposition and, and persecution, pain, and possible death is to become so discouraged that uh, they cease to be faithful to God. And history tells us that this was precisely what happened in John's day, that they stopped following Christ faithfully. So here God says in this revelation that Jesus was the faithful martyr who did not turn aside. Even from the shameful death of the cross, our Lord Jesus did not turn aside. And so we are to be willing to suffer for Christ's sake. Christ is a second, the firstborn of the dead. Jesus Christ is the firstborn of his Father. This again has to do uh, not ontologically, uh, but economically, Jesus is uh, the firstborn of the Father. In the economics of the outworking of salvation, Jesus is the firstborn of the Father. And as such, he, he has supreme authority, supreme rule uh, over all things. He demonstrated that authority in his resurrection by conquering death. He even has authority over death itself. He says, as we read in our, uh, in the, before the introductory uh, sermon, he has the keys to, to death and to Hades itself. So John is saying here that Christ, as the firstborn, has brothers and sisters who he's taking to glory. They will enter into his glory, most particularly on that final day when their bodies, uh, along with their souls, are, are glorified. And so they too then, it's a tremendous message, isn't it, to a, a church that is under persecution, being threatened with violence and death, that they too will experience victory with Jesus over death and all other enemies because Christ is the firstborn of the dead. Christ is alive. He's he overcame death uh, in his uh, resurrection. But then third, we read that he's the ruler of the kings of the earth, which means that no matter what dictator struts around of the world today on the stage of human history, imagining himself to be all-powerful and using that power to exhibit his cruelty as we are seeing uh, today, the Apostle John says that Jesus Christ is sovereign over all. Every king, every governor, every president or dictator who's, who bears authority is subject to Jesus Christ. 
whether that person recognizes it or not. John, therefore, issues a warning to such individuals. Let all tyrants tremble because Jesus is king. He's the ruler of the kings of the earth. And they will answer to the Lord Jesus Christ, the great judge, whether now or whether at the final judgment. They will answer, ultimately, to the ruler of the kings of the earth. This is a, a great comfort. It's a great comfort for John, who's on the island of Patmos because of cruel dictatorship. He's, it's, a, it's a great encouragement to these seven churches who are undergoing persecution. It's quite evident from what we read about those churches, the the address to those churches that we'll come to later here in the book of Revelation. It's a, it's a great comfort to churches everywhere in all time that Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth. The triune God puts his blessing upon and sends his greeting to each and all of us, every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, in every church, each person of the Holy Trinity puts his blessing upon and sends their greeting upon every member of the Lord Jesus Christ. And each member of the Trinity labors for the salvation of each true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is a Trinitarian experience. God the Father provides salvation for us. He decrees our salvation. God the Spirit dispenses our salvation to us. And God the Son merits our salvation for us. The order is unique in Revelation. Usually, when you read about the triune God, it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In this greeting from heaven's throne, it's Father, Spirit, Son. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Why, why is that? The reason is the imagery of Revelation, which includes candlesticks and bowls and altars and incense and fire. And these furnishings remind us of the tabernacle and the temple of God. Revelation not only presents God in the essence of his being, but also as the one who dwells in his heavenly tabernacle. You remember how the book of Hebrews tells us uh, that the tabernacle and the temple here on earth were just uh, patterns of the true tabernacle in heaven. And so John sees God in the essence of his being, dwelling, God the Father, who is and who was and who is to come, dwelling in the midst of his people in fullness by the sevenfold Spirit. It's a wondrous thing uh, to think about. Which, which of the three persons of the Trinity do, do we need most? Father, Spirit, or the Son? Samuel Rutherford remarked that he didn't know which divine person he needed most. But he loved each of them, and he needed them all, and so do we. And we must seek to know the three persons of the blessed Trinity who dwells in the archetype of those 
types who dwells in heaven in glorious perfection. Throughout his greeting, John is saying, there's no trial in your life that God isn't fully equipped to deal with. Nothing you face is too difficult for the triune God to deal with. He was, he is, he is to come. He's the sevenfold spirit. He's Jesus Christ who has faithfully borne witness to God. And when we ask how sinful, broken, fragile sinners can be brought through